afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Honesty. I currently serve as our events coordinator here for our public lecture series at IWP, as well as a current uh, master's student as well. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two that are online, and 18 degrees, sorry about that, and 18 degrees of graduate study. If you are at all interested in learning more about us here at IWP, please feel free to grab myself or another staff member at the conclusion of the event. Again, to support the work of IWP, please visit us at iwp.edu forward slash donate. And before we begin tonight, um, can I ask that everybody scooch towards the center of the road just in case we have any latecomers, as well as turn your electronic devices on silent. So I'll give you just a couple seconds there. Thank you, everyone. So I would like to begin by introducing the IWP's president, Ambassador Aldana Bosch, who will be introducing our esteemed guest speaker this afternoon. Ambassador Aldana Z. Bosch was born in Warsaw, Poland, where she later earned her MD at the Warsaw Medical Academy before continuing her career in areas including private practice, corporate medicine, and clinical care. In 2004, she was appointed as the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Estonia. For her service in country, she was awarded the Order of the Cross of Terra Mariana First Class by Estonia's President, the Distinguished Service Cross of the Estonian Defense Forces, and the Cross of Merit of the Estonian National Police Board. In 2012, Ambassador Bosch went on to serve on the University of North Carolina's Board of Governors. Then from 2013 to 2015, she served as North Carolina's Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, overseeing more than 18,000 employees across the state and a $2 billion budget. In 2020, President Donald Trump nominated Ambassador Bosch to be the U.S. Ambassador to Canada. Ambassador Bosch also serves on the boards of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, the Council of American Ambassadors, Duke University Law Board of Visitors, and is currently the president of the Institute of World Politics. With that, please welcome Ambassador Bosch. Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Welcome. A lot of familiar faces. Uh, the familiar faces that have a warmth in their heart for the Republic of Estonia, as I see from, from the audience. So today we have the pleasure of hearing Ambassador Christian Fried, who will deliver the lecture, The War in Ukraine, an Estonian Perspective. Ambassador Fried has served as Estonia's ambassador to the United States since May of 2021. Before assuming this current, his current duties, Ambassador Peek served for nearly three years as the permanent secretary of the Estonian Ministry of Defense. In this role, he was responsible for the management and the coordination of both the ministry and its subordinate agencies, including the Estonian Defense Force, the Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service, and the Center for Defense Investments. Prior to becoming the permanent secretary, Ambassador Peek worked as the undersecretary for defense policy in the Ministry of Defense from 2017 through 2018. And prior to that, from 2015 to 2017, he served as the director of the National Security and the Defense Coordination Unit of the Estonian Government Office, in which he coordinated the development and the implementation of the whole of government interagency approach to national security. Prior to joining the Ministry of Defense, Ambassador Preet worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on NATO issues, mainly pertaining to the enlargement and its partnership with, uh, partnership with Russia, the Ukraine, Georgia, and the Security Policy and Arms Control Bureau. Additionally, he has held assignments as a diplomat covering trade and economic issues at the Estonian Embassy here in Washington, DC, and as Foreign Trade and World Trade Organization Specialist at the Foreign Ministry's headquarters in Tallinn. Ambassador Preek holds a master's degree in Strategic Studies program of the United States Army War College. 
and he has a bachelor's degree in political science and economics from the University of Tartu in Estonia. With that, please welcome Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bosch. Uh, thank you for uh, this gracious invitation uh, to speak here today. But, uh, but uh, thank you for uh, your uh, service for, for this country, as well as to the, the allies, including, including my country. It's been, uh, it's been incredible to, uh, to have you as one of the supporters of the, let's say, Transatlantic uh, Coast. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here today, and, uh, and uh, equally happy to, to see some uh, familiar faces here. Uh, this gives me uh, a lot of uh, uh, courage, but if not, some pressure. <laughs> but uh, uh, Ambassador Walsh uh, 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 described uh, uh, my, my bio or my, my career path here. I have been dealing with the uh, transatlantic uh, security issues, including the uh, uh, Estonia-US bilateral, but also uh, the wider uh, NATO framework relationship uh, for for uh, uh, quite some time. Uh, despite that, of course, my my uh, uh, experience is uh, relatively uh, short compared to the uh, transatlantic uh, security ties uh, that date back at least uh, uh, to the Second World War, if not, uh, if not uh, back to uh, even earlier times. But let's say, uh, let's stick to the let's say uh, the uh, the current version of it, uh, uh, or, or most current version of it uh, that uh, uh, brought us through the uh, through the Cold War uh, after the. After the atrocities of uh, the Second World War. Now, uh, uh, even comparing the uh, the crisis that uh, that happened during the uh, during the uh, Cold War time, I would argue that uh, that the transatlantic uh, community is going through the most serious. Uh, most serious security crisis uh, uh, that we have faced uh, since the uh, Second World War uh, right now. Even, even, even further, I would argue that the global uh, security is at uh, its most uh, perilous and most dangerous uh, stage, uh, stage right, uh, right now since the, uh, since the Second World War. And it's most likely, unfortunately, uh, uh, getting even worse before it starts uh, uh, to get uh, uh, to get better. I will mostly uh, talk about the uh, the war in uh, uh, Ukraine the, that, uh, that has happened uh, that, that as a result of uh, uh, Russian aggression against uh, against Ukraine. But uh, but I would I would like to argue that this uh, this war certainly is not a Local or regional uh, phenomenon, but uh, that this war has much more uh, wider, wider consequences. So uh, uh, I think it is also in the uh, in the program or the uh, agenda that I would like to, to first uh, 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 describe all the uh, the war and the tragedy uh, that that we see uh, happening in Ukraine uh, is not a result of a let's say. A temporary misunderstanding or uh, or uh, something like that, but uh, but it's uh, uh, rather a long term a part of a long term uh, Russian strategic uh, gamble. Secondly, uh, I would like to argue that uh, uh, what is happening in Ukraine is uh, certainly uh, not just about Ukraine, but uh, but it has uh, much wider uh, consequences. Thirdly. I would uh, uh, like to uh, explain our view why we think that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, crisis uh, uh, around and in, in Ukraine uh, is very much also about uh, the U.S. Uh, white, white interests. And, uh, and fourth, 
I would uh, like to uh, to state our understanding of the strategic objective uh, uh, related to, the, uh, to this war at uh, this particular perilous time of uh, history, and hope to uh, hope to reach uh, these uh, strategic uh, objectives. Now, uh, now, uh, whereas uh, this. Uh, uh, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine, that uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be very clear, uh, did not start uh, uh, just last year, but uh, well, in fact started in 2014. Uh, this uh, aggression has uh, received uh, a lot of uh, a lot of attention. The uh, the interpretations on on uh, how this actually uh, came about. And what's uh, what's behind uh, behind that have been widely uh, widely different, not only in America but also uh, also uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, there are there are many who argue that uh, uh, that uh, this uh, uh, this war is a result of uh, of uh, uh, temporary misunderstandings, or or that uh, this war has uh, has been uh, Created by by some uh, irresponsible uh, steps uh, uh, by the West, but uh, as we see it, uh, having lived very close to uh, to Russia, in fact bordering Russia uh, uh, throughout our, our history, we see this uh, conflict in very uh, different different colors. Again, Estonia. Has, a, has an experience of, uh, of living and uh, more or less surviving uh, uh, in this neighborhood uh, since uh, uh, the current uh, nowadays territory of Estonia was uh, in, first inhabited uh, around uh, 11,000 years ago. I mean, whereas the, the first settlers were uh, uh, hunter gatherers, you know, came in. Uh, came in and went out, and uh, they may not have looked exactly like me or my, my colleague Ari, who's uh, sitting in the, uh, uh, in the audience right now. But we, st we still uh, were uh, one of the very early uh, uh, nations that actually uh, settled down in, uh, in Europe. Now, whereas uh, it's difficult to, to assess the, uh, the very early history or how exactly uh, the, uh, the, uh, the regional uh, power power dynamics uh, went. What we do know is that uh, since the uh, around middle part of uh, the 11th century, uh, Estonia has experienced uh, around you know different historians call it differently, but uh, let's use the, the, the figure around 70 attempts uh, of uh, invasion. From, uh, from our eastern neighbors, uh, where that is currently uh, known as Russia. So uh, we have uh, experienced the, the, uh, our share of uh, uh, imperialists. We, we have exper experienced our, our share of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, different fights with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Russia. And uh, unfortunately, uh, between uh, 1710 and uh, 1918 and 1940 to 1991, uh, we were subjugated. We were part of part of the uh, first the, uh, the uh, Russian Empire, and between 1940 to 1991, we were uh, uh, occupied and annexed by the Soviet Union. So we, we have a very good insight into uh, what's been going on there, uh, what's been the mindset of different people, and, and let's, not, uh, uh, let's not forget uh, the, the current uh, leadership of, uh, of uh, the Russian Federation uh, uh, actually went through their formative years during the, during the Soviet Union, got, got their training from the Soviet Union, uh, got the first uh, job experience uh, uh, through the Soviet Union. Anyway, uh, we 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 have had a situation when uh, that where 
in the beginning of 1990s, in the very early days of 1990s, uh, uh, Russian Federation uh, uh, did inherit uh, the, uh, the seat of Russia at the uh, different, behind different tables, or at the different tables, but most importantly, uh, the seat of the uh, UN uh, Security Council. Russia has been able to uh, to uh, to use its uh, uh, not entirely strong hand, uh, or play play its uh, not that strong hand very well, and uh, and has used uh, uh, these uh, let's say uh, inherited uh, uh, seeds, inherited uh, uh, levers uh, from the Soviet Union uh, quite well. So. Uh, this this has uh, uh, allowed her to act not if not as a global sport, uh, uh, global shaper because after all uh, for uh, uh, shaping the global landscape to uh, to be a relevant actor actor not only in your own country but also uh, uh, in the wider uh, international arena. It takes a lot of uh, economic commitment. It takes a, a lot of uh, uh, soft power, but uh, but uh, Russia has been uh, uh, playing quite well with the role of uh, let's say global spoiler, where where uh, uh, many uh, global uh, events, uh, uh, global uh, activities uh, were not uh, uh, possible without uh, uh, without uh, at least taking into account their ability. To, uh, to use the veto, veto in uh, the uh, UN Security Council, or or use other levers, uh, so so that uh, uh, to kind of spoil the uh, particularly uh, any activities that, uh, that the United States may have uh, or any designs that the United States may have. Had. So uh, uh, yet. Uh, despite all, all that, despite despite of the let's say uh, inherited uh, uh, seat uh, of the uh, Soviet Union and uh, and the uh, and uh, the uh, national resources, the military uh, that uh, that uh, uh, Russia uh, possesses, uh, President Putin has uh, been uh, constantly perfectly aware of. Uh, her country, or his country's uh, uh, weakening hand because of uh, demographic trends, because, because of uh, trends uh, with uh, energy resources, for example. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, he's seemingly, uh, even personally, being obsessed about uh, the uh, Russian uh, uh, historic, uh, historic uh, imperial, imperial, imperial past. Now, uh, so it's a combination of these two two factors. Uh, uh, we have witnessed again living next to uh, next to Russia, having uh, pretty much all of our of our uh, intelligence uh, resources uh, directed at uh, understanding Russia, assessing Russia, predicting Russia. Uh, we we've seen the uh, the process whereby uh, Russia has been uh, uh, prepared, both in terms of uh, economic policy, also some uh, uh, social uh, social developments or the social preparations, as well as uh, certainly military uh, practical steps, has been prepared for uh, uh, for major major war if necessary. At least since uh, since since the uh, late part of two uh, thousands. Additionally, what we have seen is that uh, uh, that President Putin himself and uh, his uh, let's say state curated or uh, state led uh, media has uh, slowly moved from uh, ridiculing the neighboring nations as inept. Or uh, as uh, someone who is who are not important to the intercom, to actually questioning their national identity and even the right to exist. And Ukraine is the is the most 
prominent example of, uh, of this trend, where uh, even uh, in a few years ago, uh, uh, in the Russian media, uh, even in, in Russian uh, political speeches, there was a lot of this uh, uh, kind of uh, diminishing uh, attitude or, or a ridiculing attitude when it came to anything Ukrainian. But, uh, uh, but since uh, certainly, let's say, two years ago, it, uh, uh, it's been turned into uh, uh, questioning the whole identity and the right, uh, right to exist of, uh, of this uh, particular country. So th this was the part of, uh, part of uh, uh, not a uh, accident, but, but actually uh, something that, uh, that uh, uh, has been uh, part of a longer, longer trend uh, of uh, preparing uh, Russia uh, for, a, uh, for a conflict that actually involves its, uh, its neighboring countries. Now, now there, then there is this other, other point where uh, 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 we we all have heard uh, different interpretations of uh, of this uh, conflict, and I very much understand when uh, uh, when Americans ask their political leaders, why should we worry about uh, the uh, the war in, uh, in Ukraine? Isn't this uh, something that is uh, far away from us? Isn't this something that is just a quarrel? Uh, between the two Slavic countries, something that we shouldn't care about. Now, there, there are many ways uh, uh, how to respond to this uh, organization. But what I would argue here is that uh, whereas uh, even Vladimir Putin himself, but certainly uh, the wider uh, uh, circle of uh, Russian elite seems to be almost obsessed about uh, Ukraine, almost obsessed about uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, will to, uh, to be uh, an independent country, to, uh, to uh, go its own path. This, uh, uh, this war is certainly not only about Ukraine. And uh, this, this is uh, very clear when uh, one goes through different uh, political speeches uh, that, uh, that uh, the uh, president of Russia uh, and uh, uh, many other members of uh, his leadership uh, circle, uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, for example, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, have made uh, since the uh, uh, run-up of the war, uh, but, but certainly also uh, during the war. This is also clear by the so-called uh, treaty proposals that, uh, uh, that uh, the Russian Federation presented to, uh, to the US and to NATO in uh, December 2021. The, the proposals that, uh, uh, that they uh, uh, used as a uh, negotiating, uh, part, as part of their negotiating tactic, and, uh, and the uh, proposals that they have referred to uh, back uh, several times uh, since then. So basically, we can we can argue there that uh, that this uh, war uh, certainly is about uh, uh, subjugating entire Ukraine and uh, and uh, Ukrainian uh, nation. By now, I would I would even argue that uh, that uh, that when uh, talking about Ukraine. Uh, the, the Russian, uh, these uh, public stated goals uh, that, have, uh, that have been uh, spelled out in the most uh, nasty, if not the genocidal way, by, uh, by their former president, uh, uh, Medvedev, is to annihilate an the uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, nation. This is not just about uh, changing the leadership of the government. This is about uh, wiping, uh, wiping off, off, uh, off the face of uh, anything that uh, resembles uh, uh, of uh, independent uh, Ukraine, anything that resembles of uh, uh, independent uh, Ukrainian identity. But, uh, but on top of that, it's certainly also about uh, creating a, a uh, belt of 
that's a privileged uh, zone of privileged interest along the uh, uh, western uh, border of, of Russia. And this is also about demolishing, demolishing the uh, currently existing uh, uh, European uh, security uh, architecture. Because after all, uh, these, uh, uh, these speeches that I referred to, and, the, and uh, even more importantly, these uh, uh, so-called uh, treaty proposals, they foresaw uh, completely different uh, European uh, security architecture. They foresaw uh, the, uh, for example, for, for my country, the role of, uh, of uh, maybe notionally being uh, being member of NATO, but uh, but uh, factually uh, making us uh, uh, let's say disarmed uh, country and uh, and not a equal equal member of NATO, but rather but rather uh, part of a special zone where where uh, where NATO wouldn't uh, uh, be able to uh, to operate and carry out its uh, defense. Uh, Defense uh, uh, duties. Uh, also, uh, the, these uh, treaty proposals effectively uh, would make uh, U.S. military presence uh, in uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, a thing of the past. That uh, that would have made uh, uh, NATO an alliance uh, that uh, that has uh, let's say. Rudimentary uh, U.S. U.S. presence, uh, but but uh, uh, factually uh, unable to uh, to uh, serve as the quality defense uh, allies. So, the uh, uh, subjugating, if not annihilating, uh, uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians. Uh, thirdly, uh, and secondly, uh, creating a zone of privileged uh, inter interests. Uh, uh, basically, a buffer zone uh, among its uh, uh, western uh, western uh, uh, border, and uh, and third, uh, uh, destroying the existing uh, uh, European uh, security organization. And this last point uh, uh, takes me uh, to, the, to the reason why we believe that uh, uh, that what happens in uh, uh, in war in Ukraine uh, is very much about also uh, U.S. Uh, 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 vital uh, security interests. After all, uh, since the uh, Second World War, the, the transatlantic uh, uh, bond that has uh, uh, been there between the uh, between the European three countries and, and the uh, and the US has worked in many ways. It has uh, helped to maintain uh, peace. Uh, in Europe, uh, in a way that uh, uh, no other arrangement has been able to uh, to be keep before. But very importantly, uh, this has also uh, helped the uh, European countries to, to serve as uh, confident uh, uh, allies and partners uh, to, uh, to the U.S. and, and together with uh, the U.S. Uh, globally. And uh, uh, any attempt to to destroy uh, this uh, uh, this partnership, any attempt to, to destroy this uh, security architecture that has actually delivered to, to both of the uh, sides, uh, is actually problematic uh, uh, and detrimental to both of uh, to both sides of the uh, Atlantic. Now, uh, uh, there has been uh, there, many people have uh, often pointed out that uh, uh, what happens in uh, uh, what happens in uh, uh, Ukraine is keenly uh, keenly watched uh, from uh, other parts of the world, and particularly there are references to uh, to uh, uh, People's Republic of uh, China. To pay attention, uh, paying attention to, to what's happening in, in Ukraine and, and taking uh, taking cues uh, from that. I believe, we believe, Estonia believes that, that, that this being a great case, we see very clear signs that uh, that uh, the the way this uh, the, this war was started 
the way this war has been waged, and the uh, effects that have been accompanied this war have uh, not been exactly to the liking of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of President Xi. It's not been something that, uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that the Chinese leadership uh, has uh, uh, particularly favored on that. And, and we believe that, uh, that uh, uh, the security in the Indo-Pacific will be uh, uh, heavily influenced by, uh, by, by what's happening uh, uh, and will be happening in, in Ukraine. However, I don't think that th this will only be uh, limited to, uh, to the Indo-Pacific. In fact, the whole world is uh, uh, paying attention to uh, what's happening in Ukraine. We know that uh, approximately 140, up to 143 uh, uh, members of the, uh, uh, of the UN have uh, uh, condemned the, uh, the uh, Russian invasion and have sided with the, uh, with the US, with, uh, with the, primarily with Ukraine, of course. Uh, but uh, Ukraine and, uh, and her uh, many, many friends when, uh, when uh, uh, giving their uh, their uh, assessment of uh, of the nature of the conflict and uh, declaring that uh, that this is uh, counter to uh, to uh, the human charter and pretty much any uh, every document that regulates the, uh, the global, global security uh, since since the Second World War. So so. Uh, uh, Countries are paying attention to uh, what's happened in Ukraine, what's going to be the uh, end result, uh, uh, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but certainly also uh, in, the, in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America. Quite, quite recently, uh, uh, this is not just me speaking, but, but, uh, but uh, pretty much any time I meet with uh, my counterparts uh, uh, from other uh, parts of the world, they want to uh, to understand what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, they have their own concerns. Uh, we we also know that uh, that uh, the regional organizations they have their own concerns that uh, that the environmental effects of this uh, war may may actually start uh, affecting the uh, the, uh, the, land, uh, the the life and policies in, in the in the region. A very important thing. <coughs> I, I would like to. Uh, I would like to uh, make sure that uh, uh, that uh, the Americans understand that if if this war does not end well, if this war ends in a way that actually uh, does not uh, create a new and more secure equilibrium in uh, in Europe. Uh, in Ukraine and, uh, and in Europe, but uh, but if this war uh, uh, ends, ends in a way that, that there is less security uh, in Ukraine, less security in Europe, then I would argue that uh, that uh, the partnership that the uh, U.S. and Europe has had globally, the partnership that uh, that even uh, the country uh, as mighty as the U.S. is would need when dealing with the uh, challenges stemming from the Indo-Pacific, this partnership cannot live up to, the, to its expectations. The Europeans, if the Europeans are bogged down with the, uh, with the uh, <coughs> simmering conflict or potential conflict in their own backyard, in, in fact, you, you, Ukraine is not a back, backyard, it's in, in the heart of Europe. Then Europe will not be able to uh, to be as uh, great a, uh, of a partner and ally to the U.S. Also, when, when dealing with uh, with uh, uh, in the Pacific challenge. So this this is this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, reality that uh, that I think uh, everyone has to understand. And now, what about the objective and how to reach it? We in Estonia. Uh, we see that uh, 
this invasion, this aggression being as uh, as awful as it is, being as naked as it is, there is no other possibility than to uh, to make sure that uh, that the end result of of, of this uh, conflict is a clear defeat for Russia in Ukraine and and a, and a clear victory for uh, Ukraine. We need to make sure that aggression as a tool gets thoroughly discredited. We need to make sure that uh, that the message that comes out of uh, the end game of this conflict is that aggression does not pay off. However, if the end result is something different on that, if Vladimir Putin ends up getting territory wise, or political clock wise, economic clock wise, something that he did not have before his, uh, he started this war of aggression then we believe that we are in for a very rough ride in the near, near future. This is a recipe for, for next, uh, next aggressions. And the recipe for next aggressions, not in a very distant future, but we believe that uh, considering the realities in uh, Eurasia, considering the, uh, the way uh, uh, Russia can handle its resources, manpower, natural resources, uh, industries, we believe that this uh, uh, next next stage of conflict may start pretty soon, at least uh, in the uh, let's say Western military direction. We believe that uh, Russia uh, will be able to uh, restore at least uh, uh, key capabilities in uh, in the framework of uh, two to four years. So we need to achieve. The results where, where uh, the aggression is thoroughly uh, uh, discredited. We have to achieve the results where Russia is, is uh, pushed back to Russia. And there is nothing controversial in it. People are often asking me, are you then arguing that, uh, that, uh, that Ukraine should actually liberate the territories that have been held by Russia since 2014? Yes, of course. Russia has to be pushed back to Russia. There is not, nothing controversial in it. In order to do that, we have to think strategically, we have to act strategically, and we have to make sure that, uh, that the message being delivered to, to Russia and uh, her very few allies is the following. There won't be uh, tired. The West, uh, West with Ukraine will not give up not in two months, not in three months, not in a year. But, but we will push you out from Ukraine and we will make sure that uh, the aggression uh, does not pay out. In order to do that, do that, it has to be a multi pronged approach. There is very much talk about different weapon systems. Of course, this is important. Uh, uh, this has been key part of, part of the relative success of Ukraine thus far that, uh, that Ukraine uh, has been uh, able to, uh, to hold its uh, ground. But just as, as there is no, let's say, silver bullet, silver bullet when it comes to weapons, no Leopard tank alone, no uh, Takams missile alone, no uh, uh, F-16 alone can achieve the military, military goals. We should also understand that uh, the military uh, domain alone is not enough to achieve the strategic defeat of, uh, uh, of Russia. We also have to continue uh, pushing them on sanction front. We also have to uh, continue pushing them on uh, accountability front. I, I guess you, you all have uh, uh, seen the of the International Criminal Court to, uh, to actually uh, issue a, a, an arrest warrant for uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. But, but I guess most of you would be surprised to know how 
much this actually resonate in, even in Russia. How much, how much the Russian leadership seems to be troubled by, uh, by this arrest warrant, even though no one expects Vladimir Putin to be arrested uh, tomorrow or next, or next Tuesday. So we have to, to work uh, on these uh, different pillars. We have to, uh, to basically squeeze the oxygen out of the, uh, the uh, Russian war machine, politically, militarily, economically. There are many who say that uh, sanctions do not work or they, they work only a little. My answer is that they work much better, uh, much, uh, in a much uh, efficient, more efficient way than, uh, than uh, certainly the Russians admit. They, they work in a, a more efficient way than, uh, than uh, most in the West appreciate. But uh, just uh, as I said about the military tool, the, the sanctions is not a, not a silver tool, tool for the dealer. We have to be creative, we have to uh, turn up the heat, we have to uh, both work on the uh, loopholes with the existing sanctions, both in terms of uh, what particular articles are uh, they they actually are still able to import, or what what uh, key tools they can use to, to the third countries. But we also have to uh, work on those areas that have not been sanctioned. Uh, there are too many Russian uh, banks that uh, that are used for the same uh, purposes that uh, those banks that are now sanctioned sanctioned uh, were used um, uh, uh, before. Also on the on the accountability front, uh, we. Uh, we believe that the uh, International Criminal Court has done a wonderful job. They will uh, be continuing to do that. We also know that, uh, that the uh, Ukrainians themselves are investigating the war crimes in the uh, to tune of uh, 100,000 uh, uh, different crimes yet. So every, every city or village that they liberate, there are more, more uh, uh, cases coming up. But we also uh, believe that, uh, that uh, the uh, key part of this accountability is the uh, accountability of the leadership crime and the, and the crime of uh, aggression that, uh, uh, that uh, started from Vladimir Putin and, uh, and he's in a inner circle. Even if, uh, if uh, uh, Vladimir Putin or, or his inner circle uh, will not actually face the tribunal again tomorrow, next month or, or next year, this, this is about uh, legal deterrence, and this is, this is about sending a message not only to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, Russian uh, leaders themselves, that, uh, that it's increasingly difficult for them to, to leave the Kremlin, let's put it that way. But uh, this is also about sending a message to, uh, to mid-level uh, executives, uh, mid-level uh, politicians, who uh, seeing Seeing uh, uh, the arrest warrants piling up, seeing the sanctions piling up, uh, uh, at one point uh, start to ask: Is this really something uh, uh, for me? Is this really something that uh, that I want to go along with? I think uh, I should uh, probably stop here. I see that we have uh, approximately 15 minutes left, so uh, I hope that there are some questions. Uh, maybe. Maybe you can question about the uh, inconsistencies if there were any. Maybe you can ask me about uh, some other questions. But, uh, <laughs> uh, we've asked us, we have about 15 minutes, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand and I'll call on you from there. Yes, Thank you for your time, Ambassador. Um, in your judgment, how would you assess the current uh, state of multilateral relations uh, between Estonia, uh, the other powers in Eastern Europe, so Poland, Ukraine, the rest of the Baltics, what would be called the Inframarium, as well as alongside the U.S. as far as uh, diplomatic intelligence and economic cooperation in the region? How would you assess it as currently as now? And what do you believe the ideal uh, arrangement for multilateral arrangements would be in the region in order to be a sufficient deterrence against uh, Russia in the future? Yeah. Thanks for, for the, the great question. I hope the, uh, those, those, those who are uh, following us online also uh, heard the question. Uh, but uh, 
I want the map wrapper, uh, let's say, security related uh, relations uh, uh, between the US and uh, uh, anti countries uh, in the let's say, eastern flank of uh, NATO plus Ukraine, right? Now, uh, I would argue that, uh, that these relations have never been as uh, close as they are right now. Uh, there, are, there are many, uh, many reasons, both institutional uh, reasons as well as uh, uh, you know, uh, event driven uh, uh, reasons. Uh, probably the intelligence sharing that, uh, that uh, took place uh, shortly before uh, this stage of Russian invasion started uh, last uh, February. In fact, it started 24th of February, which, ha which happens to be the Independence Day of Estonia. So, uh, our Independence Day uh, has a very uh, special, gloomy uh, side note uh, since then. This intelligence sharing, this intelligence uh, uh, making the intelligence public in, in, the, in the way and in the amounts that, uh, that happened before the war uh, was probably the best example of, uh, of using intelligence in a, in a smart way and uh, for, uh, for a purpose. Uh, I know that uh, that uh, most, if not all, uh, allies on the on the uh, NATO Eastern flank, and certainly Ukrainians, uh, uh, contributed to this effort uh, quite a lot. I I believe that uh, that this actually uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, episode uh, helped the policymakers to uh, to actually uh, uh, reach the same conclusions about the uh, about the uh, threat environment. And this, this helped to, uh, to uh, uh, put together this uh, wide coalition of countries that we see now uh, uh, supporting and helping uh, in Ukraine. There's also uh, a, a military element that is related to NATO, but, but also uh, there are uh, bilateral or uh, multilateral uh, military uh, arrangements also of NATO. And the, uh, the direction that NATO has uh, certainly taken uh, since uh, 2014, when, uh, when Russia uh, first uh, took Crimea and, uh, and then uh, started the, this uh, shadow war in uh, uh, eastern, eastern uh, Ukraine, uh, this direction has led to more practical uh, and meaningful uh, cooperation uh, between, between the allies. Uh, there are different layers there. Uh, there, but uh, what I, I'm really uh, happy and proud about is that uh, it's more and more about uh, actual capabilities, uh, actual continuous <coughs> planning, actual exercises, uh, kind of train a uh, uh, right uh, kind of mentality rather than about uh, parades, uh, uh, about uh, showing the flag, which uh, uh, does have a role sometimes. But, uh, but uh, considering the uh, security environment that we are, we are facing uh, uh, right now, uh, we should be uh, dead serious about, uh, about uh, real things and real activities. And, and uh, I feel pretty good about that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Ambassador, great speech. Uh, as we're going through your speech, I'm Bob Wentz, I'm from the Victims of the Home and War Foundation. As you're going through your speech, you said Ukraine must be victorious. And I was like, what does that look like? And then you went on to say, you know, return of all boundaries from 2014 that would be Crimea and the Donbass. Unfortunately, I don't think it, there's a lot of allies in the West that don't see it that way. And what's your feel on where we are on that as far as, you know, as far as NATO is moving towards that direction? I feel that. Uh, uh, this war has uh, injected us with uh, many doses of uh, newly found uh, self-confidence, positive self-confidence. And, uh, and uh, I believe that, that we actually need it. We, we need it to, uh, we need it to, to see that, uh, that, in fact, if we pull it together, if uh, uh, democracies uh, really decide to do something together, then we can 
prevail over the uh, over the uh, regimes by like, uh, like Putin. However, it's always like two steps forward, one step uh, one step backwards. There are always uh, those who uh, doubt. There are always those who uh, who uh, self deter the the allies and I kind of get it where the, uh, where, where it comes from but we we in Estonia we would certainly argue and I personally would argue for uh, uh, using this self confidence uh, and uh, and trusting also the Ukrainians after all it's the Ukrainians who are doing the fighting. It's the Ukrainians who, uh, uh, against all odds, against all the uh, smart people in the Pentagon, in the White House, in other places, in think tanks, who argued that they would only, uh, you know, uh, be able to resist for a couple of days and then, then they would fold. The Ukrainians did it. Uh, I believe that we, we should uh, have the same attitude when it comes to uh, to actually liberating the uh, the rest of the territory. I am not, I'm not saying that it's, it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that, uh, that it, it's going to happen uh, if only the US would, uh, or any other ally would, uh, would give some miracle weapon to, uh, uh, to Ukraine. There are no miracle weapons. But, uh, but, but we should uh, trust ourselves, we should trust them, and we should inject them, them also with our trust. But very importantly, even though I said there are no miracle weapons, we should not ask the question. Okay, what should uh, what should we uh, give uh, to them? But we should uh, only ask, uh, or which we should only say, we should give them whatever is necessary to actually reach this uh, this objective. Yes, Dr. Lachowski. Yes, I'm John Lachowski from the Institute here. Um, your point about accountability is a very powerful one when it comes to the psychological dimension of this war. And I'm wondering about the degree to which you think adequate measures have been taken in the psychological realm when it comes to uh, demoralizing the Russian public. Putin, has been, Putin basically has enjoyed a monopoly of information and communications. We've stopped our broadcasts uh, in Russian uh, to, to Russia and Ukraine. And so there's very little unfiltered information that reaches large segments of the Russian population, particularly the older generations. Uh, I am wondering about what you think can realistically be done to to change this, and, and and I'm wondering whether you know I remember Vladimir Bukovsky, the great Soviet human rights activist, who was recommending that the countries of of the former Soviet bloc should have a uh, a Nuremberg trial for communism which would include people like Putin and the work that he's done, and that this would cast a further shadow on, on, on Putin's revanchism. And I'm wondering what you think about that. Yeah, great question, and I uh, wish we had uh, uh, first the smarter people than me uh, here, but, but also maybe uh, next four or five days to discuss that. Anyway, I'm a firm, strong believer in uh, in uh, power of uh, information, I'm, I'm a firm, uh, strong believer uh, in power of uh, truth against the this fake reality that uh, that these uh, autocratic uh, dictatorial regimes create. I myself, I grew up in the uh, Soviet. Estonia that was still occupied by the Soviet Union. I I, I was taught by my, my parents how to, to find the uh, VOA, uh, Voice of America, uh, from all these uh, crackling noises and, uh, and everything, and how to listen to their daily, daily broadcast in Estonia. And this was our window to, uh, to the free world. 
Now, I think when it comes to uh, knowledge Russia, we have to, of course, understand that the, the, that the information of the landscape, the, the, uh, the logic of, uh, of consumption of the information is, has, has very much changed. But, but, uh, but some things are still uh, universal, right? So uh, I think that when it comes to the, uh, to the uh, uh, information to Russian public, we, we have to think of the uh, distinct between the longer term goals as well as the, the shorter term goals. On the accountability and the uh, uh, information about uh, Russian war crimes, for example, and, and also the, let's say, deter deterrence of accountability out there, I believe that we uh, we have to uh, make these efforts to uh, actually get through the, uh, to the to Russians because after all uh, the Nuremberg as the image is is something that is very powerful in the uh, Russian uh, collective uh, uh, collective memory. Uh, of course, I'm not naive. I'm not saying that if uh, if the ICC uh, uh, Issued, issued the uh, arrest warrant now, or if uh, there were going to be the uh, uh, tribunal uh, on, on the crime of aggression uh, issuing some, some statement, then uh, out of the sudden, all of the Russians would, uh, uh, who currently support Putin would uh, uh, turn on the day in the dreams. But I think this, this is like the long term effort that we, we have to keep this information going so that. Uh, uh, at least something uh, that seeps through the, uh, the, the cracks and, and uh, reaches people who actually uh, are paying attention, are, are thinking through. However, on the, on the uh, shorter term uh, front, I personally believe, this, this, is my, this is just me and I'm not a professional uh, uh, you know, communications or, or information operations guy right, anyway, but, but I personally believe that in the longer, uh, longer term, or shorter term, sorry, we, we should uh, focus on uh, on making sure that uh, that every Russian not only has has the access but but pretty much is forced to get the information of uh, of uh, how tragic their own war against uh, Ukraine is not only to Ukrainians but but also to to Russia as a country and uh, and, uh, and Russian military. Uh, Russian, uh, uh, Russian leadership has uh, purposely tried to hide this information, suppress this information. We should uh, make sure that, that we are delivering this information uh, uh, to the, those families who have people actually fighting there, uh, to also those families who, who are at risk of uh, their, uh, uh, their sons and uh, husbands being uh, drafted to, to the war effort. I, I believe that uh, in, the, in, in short term this may be more effective than the, uh, than the let's say, uh, uh, more uh, strategic uh, issue pertaining to the, uh, to the uh, accountability of uh, uh, Russian uh, state. We have time for one more question here. If there are any in the audience? Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Ambassador. It's a fantastic talk. Um, obviously, the talk of NATO has come up uh, in the conversation. Uh, of course, for Finland being a, a new member of that. Curious, you, your thoughts about Sweden. Uh, obviously, Turkey has their own, um, you know, demands, and Hungary is doing what Hungary does. But, but where do you see where do you see that ending up? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much for asking this question. Uh, but, uh, uh, I will not only answer about uh, Sweden, but since I, for some reason, forgot to to uh, touch the Ukraine NATO angle. I, I have to uh, say very shortly uh, something about that too. On, on uh, Sweden, uh, it's only uh, security-wise, it's logical. It's beneficial to, to all uh, current uh, NATO members, and of course uh, to Sweden, uh, to have Sweden as soon as possible the member of, uh, member of NATO. Having seen the, uh, the military panels uh, uh, sweating over uh, the challenges of, in, in, uh, in the Baltic Sea, uh, uh, and uh, including the challenges of, uh, of uh, uh, countries outside of NATO uh, being there, but, uh, but not being uh, allies. I know how big of a difference uh, and how many better opportunities to, to deter and defend the Baltic Sea uh, 
in the Baltic Sea region, uh, that would uh, that would give. So uh, I I only hope that we, we can uh, uh, see Sweden as soon as possible. But I, I have to say something about Ukraine. Uh, fifteen years ago, now even like a week more than fifteen years ago, uh, NATO had some state of government uh, uh, get, uh, get got together in Bucharest and uh, and stated in the uh, in their official statement after the uh, NATO summit that uh, that Ukraine will be the member of NATO. No no uh, timelines, uh, no uh, details, but just a statement. Since that time, uh, 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 the heads of state and government have stated the same thing repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. We believe that uh, that, Croatia, uh, that Russia uh, uh, feeds of great great ones, or Russian imperialists you know, feeds on, on great ones, uh, and uh, on the other hand, the uh, the NATO membership has been the only recipe. Against uh, against uh, uh, Russian imperialists uh, in the areas uh, border bordering uh, uh, Russia, Our, my country being uh, a prime example of that. So we believe that, uh, that we uh, in, the, in this very context that I described, uh, in this context where where Ukraine is fighting for uh, for life, and also in the context where uh, Ukraine actually last uh, September formally applied for NATO membership. We have to make one step further, one step further from uh, from uh, the Cooper statement by saying that uh, that uh, not only uh, Ukraine will uh, become a member of NATO one day, but uh, but NATO uh, uh, governments and Ukrainian government will start discussing how to lay out the the eventual roadmap that that would uh, take uh, Ukraine one day to NATO. And this, this is not yet, uh, decided yet, but, uh, but we hope that we will uh, uh, be there um, in terms of this one uh, next step uh, quite soon. And I thank you so very much for being here today and uh, listening to, to me. Ambassador Creek, I wanted to thank you very much for this insightful uh, presentation, but very specifically for for your vision of the future for the Ukraine, and also by presenting the realities of the horror of what's happening in the Ukraine on the ground. I wanted to present you with a token of our appreciation from the Institute, one of our friends, and, and, and again, a, a thank you. And then before we close out for everyone, I would also like to announce that we have an upcoming gala for the uh, Institute of World Politics. It will be uh, affectionately called from IWP with love, an evening of espionage at, uh, the, at uh, the, the, on um, October 26th at the International Spy Museum. And if that catches your fancy, <laughs> then please make sure that you check online at iwp.edu slash events to sign up and, and, and hopefully attend. And if you enjoy the presentation of Ambassador Creek, and if you're interested in attending any of our upcoming lectures, or you're interested in perhaps uh, experimenting with our certificates or coming back to one of our master's or doctoral programs, then please see our chief recruiter who is sitting right here, put a please raise your hand or I, again online. So thank you very much for joining us and Ambassador, thank you.